Okay, it looks like we have quite a few people in here. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Anyone else that loads through, they can catch up. Um, this is also recorded, so they could always go look at it later. Um, so welcome, welcome. Uh, for those of you who've been here before, welcome back. Uh, for those of you who have not been here before, I do not recognize a couple of those names. So welcome to the Marine Environmental Education Center. Um, we are located in Hollywood, Florida, and we are a pretty small facility. So right now we are still closed to the public. Uh, we cannot safely socially distance. Um, so we've decided to move all of our virtual programming online, um, all of our programs to a virtual platform. So we could still provide some really cool resources uh, to teach people about marine science topics, environmental science topics, and conservation topics. Um, so we started this webinar series. It is offered every Saturday from 1 to 2 p.m. Um, and we reached out to all of our scientific friends to say, what are you comfortable presenting on? What are you happy to teach us all about today? Um, and we are lucky enough today to be talking to Kiva Rood, our very own Meek Education intern. Um, so one of his major projects for this internship has been creating a really cool program um, to present to all of you today. Um, so he is going to be teaching you about the Florida Everglades, which if you're not from Florida, you might not know, it's a super important e ecosystem to us down here, very vital. We are trying to protect it. Um, so he is going to give us a bit of a presentation on that. Uh, Kiever, like I said, is one of our education interns. He is actually a student at Nova Southeastern University, majoring in environmental science and minoring in GIS and marketing. Um, so he has lots and lots of feathers in his cap. Um, we are very lucky to have him. Uh, since this is the webinar platform, everyone is muted um, and everyone is going to keep their videos off for the duration of the program. Um, it's just so you can most easily hear Kiva as he's presenting. Um, but if you do have any questions, comments, concerns, technical issues, put it in the chat um, or use that little raise hand button at the bottom of your screen and I'll be monitoring that the entire program. Um, at the end of the program, Keeper will answer any questions and he might have a couple questions of his own for you. So make sure to pay attention. Um, otherwise, I think that's about it for me. I will go ahead and answer some of those little questions in the chat. Welcome back to those of you who are here again. Um, otherwise, I think I will mute myself and Keeper, whenever you're ready, you can take it away. Hey everyone, my name is Keeper Rood as Taylor introduced me. Um, I am a freshman here at NSU in South Florida, great university, and I am about to present the Florida Everglades to you all. And I hope you all had a great morning and an early start to your afternoon. So this is what basically the Florida Everglades looks like in the heart of the Everglades bird's eye view or helicopter view. It is a lot of water. It is a wetland and it also has a lot of dry land to it. So what is the Everglades? The Everglades is a wetland located in South Florida. It is one of the largest subtropical wetlands in North America and is a national park that you can go into and actually explore. It is home to over 405 different species and many of these species are only found here, known as endemic. So the word endemic basically means that if an animal is from South Florida, it just lives in South Florida. So it is endemic to Florida. So the opposite of that would be sort of invasive. So if they're from South Florida, South Florida, but if they make their way to, let's say, um, Europe, they're not endemic there. They're endemic to South Florida. So where exactly is the Everglades? The Everglades is located in Everglades City, South Florida. Very simple. The Everglades is 1.5 million acres of land total, which is approximately 7,800 miles squared. And this is the Everglades right now. Um, later in the webinar, you'll see a great video explaining how these, this is basically this, just the Everglades National Park, but it used to, um, it used to round around Lake Okeechobee. And unfortunately, 
you'll see over the webinar that's only around over here where the Everglades National Park is. So the initial conservation effort and who started it. In 1928, landscape architect Ernest Coe began a concentrated effort to designate a tropical Everglades National Park. Currently, there is an effort to restore the Everglades region under a plan called the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, known as SERP. Referred to as the world's largest ecosystem restoration effort, the SERP will cost over $7 billion and will take over 20 years to develop, which is quite a long time. Though Ernest Coe, his persistence paid off when he and others persuaded Congress to designate the Everglades as a national park in 1934. The Everglades contains floods and stops homes. The Everglades contains the floods and basically this conservation effort tried to stop the homes being built on it. So it would prevent that and it would also try to continue the the nutrition and the filtering out of pollutants and the nutrition in the Everglades. So the history. The Everglades National Park was established in 1947 to conserve the natural landscape and prevent further destruction of its lands, plants, and animals. The Everglades from colonial settlers was actually viewed as just good farmland and not a biome to preserve. The Everglades Forever Act is a Florida law passed in 1994 designated to restore the Everglades. So here is a great picture of the history of the Everglades. You can see the long, nice trees, the nice dirt road. And um, settlers just really thought it was good farmland. They didn't know the true potential of the Everglades. They didn't know what it was going to be like now. And um, as the years passed, it's changed a lot. So the importance of the Everglades, very important slide. The Everglades provides one third of the drinking water found in Florida and irrigation water systems for agriculture. The wetlands improve water quality by filtering out pollutants and absorbing waste nutrients, clear aquifers and reduce flooding. And this picture actually shows the historic flow of the Everglades. So basically these are the canals running south in central Florida into Lake Okeechobee. And while Lake Okeechobee floods, it basically goes all over the Everglades and it floods the Everglades and it doesn't allow it to filter out its nutrients and the pollutants in there. So the Floridians made a current flow and a nice, very nice plan. These are the same canals. It goes to Lake Okeechobee, and then they actually made man-made canals that release that water from the flood or the rainy season, and it releases it into the Atlantic Ocean, so that hardly any of it goes to the Everglades. So it basically allows the Everglades to do its job. The importance of the Everglades, part two, contains over 405 different species of animals. During the summer rainy season, during the summer rainy season makes water overflow from Lake Okeechobee along its southern shoreline, moving southward across sawgrass marshes and other wetland areas. This then goes into the Everglades for it to filter the water and prevents all that water flooding the areas around it. So, if you guys have seen the Everglades. It has a lot of animals, it has a lot of different animals. And if you talk to any kind of expert and if you just pick out a Florida animal, they'll be like, well, maybe it's in the Everglades because it has a very good chance of it being in there. These are the different kinds of animals in the Everglades, such as the snail kite, Southern leopard frog, the Halloween pennant dragonfly, and of course, the one we all know, the American alligator.
Okay. So I have this nice video that is a very, very, um, very good video that shows basically the, not really the progress, but unfortunately just the loss of land that the Everglades have had um, in the 1900s to 2011. So actually, I just wanted to stop that, hold on. Um, as you can see here, 1919, you see the Everglades around Lake Okeechobee, and you see all of the canals that I was talking about. And um, basically, you see all of this land and all the land known to different kinds of animals and even endangered animals. But watch what happens as time goes on. So it's, the picture is a little faint, but this red area is actually urbanization. These are more people coming into the state of Florida. This is Lake Okeechobee right here. And what was once the Everglades going all around over here is now just over here. So all of those animals had to relocate to over here. And I can tell you there are a lot of different endangered animals, unfortunately, in the Everglades that we need to protect. Wetlands slash biomes. Wetlands are areas where water covers the soil or the surface of the soil all year or for varying periods of time during the year. Wetlands may support both aquatic and terrestrial species. It is also the largest remaining subtropical biome left in North America. And while I say aquatic and terrestrial species, that's basically meaning species that can live on land and species that can live in the water. And as the Everglades being a wetland, it can support that because there's a lot of areas that are covered in water. And there are also areas that are just dry, covered with land soil. So that maybe the Florida panther can live on and they can walk on. And uh, a fish cannot live there, but they have a lot of room in the Everglades. So the diversity of animal and plant species. The Everglades is known for its diversity in animal and plant species. Endangered species here include the Florida panther, the American alligator, and bull sharks. Unfortunately, um, one of my favorite animals was actually the Florida panther. And I'm, this is a great picture just looking at a Florida panther. And it's just very saddening to see that it is endangered and it is very close to being extinct, which is the definition of endangered. So every time when you go out to the Everglades, you will see, you'll see at least one kind of animal in less than a minute. There are over 150 different plant species in the Everglades. And I can tell you that second bullet is very true. I don't know if you guys have all gone out to the Everglades. I highly recommend it. But the Everglades is something special. Um, even when you stop by it on the highway and just take a break from driving and you just look out through your window, you can see the canals of the Everglades just running or yeah, running or flowing by the highway. Um, it's just amazing. And you'll see a lot of different birds flying. You'll see a lot of different plant species. And I highly recommend it because the, the Everglades National Park is an amazing place to go to. So an example of these ecosystem engineers, the American alligator, top native predator of the Florida Everglades. Perhaps the greatest contribution the alligator makes to the ecosystem and its inhabitants are gator holes. 
adults create these holes and expand year by year. These submerged de depressions tend to stay full of water throughout the dry season and even extended droughts. So gator holes are basically um, very useful in the Everglades for a lot of different species and the alligators. Um, I believe I have a picture, yes. How do gator holes work? So American alligators, they dig up holes during the dry season that can actually hold water. So um, I, if you lived here in Florida for the past maybe month or so, other than yesterday and the day before that, it hasn't really rained much. So um, during these times, these animals need water to survive. And the alligator digs the holes and water is kept in there and it can hold all the fish that need to be in there, the insects, the water bugs. It also helps the wading birds because they feed off of the fish in the water. It helps all of these different kinds of species because it gives them the true form of life resources. So the different kinds of invasive species here in the Everglades. You have the Burmese python, which is very popular. You have the green iguanas. You have feral hogs. You have cane toads, lionfish, Cuban tree frogs, giant African land snails, and tegu lizards. So I wanted to talk about here, um, invasive species are basically species that do not belong in the area that they're in now. So the Burmese python is, they, they have a lot of python in the Everglades and they are trying to get them out, but um, they are invasive because they don't belong here. They don't belong in South Florida, they don't belong in the Everglades, and they are basically ripping up the entire Everglades, all of the animals that they can see, they can eat, they can even eat alligators. It is very, very crazy. But um, we have a lot of invasive species here. Actually, also, this is a size of a Burmese python as well. It takes four men to carry a Burmese python. They can grow up to that size. So what is the problem with the Everglades? Over the past hundred years, the Everglades has been suffering from pollution, water loss, loss of habitat, and loss of wildlife. Since the 1940s, humans have been draining the Everglades. Now half of the Everglades has been drained. And I showed this in the video earlier. Um, in 1911, the Everglades was around Lake Okeechobee. And since then, now it's basically half. The protected area of the Everglades has been more than half, has, yeah has been more than have since the initial establishment of the park. So I just want to talk about the protected air. So the protected air, basically areas that they cannot kind of interfere with because of the animals and the species that live there, because maybe they're endangered, um, kind of like a wading bird or the manatee right here, um, they cannot build on that and they cannot lose it. So what can we do to help the Everglades? It unfortunately may not sound so serious to you, but those Everglades, if I mean, th those animals, if they become extinct, they cannot come back and uh, we need to give them as much protection as we can. What we can do to help is recycle, don't litter, using a car less to prevent pollution, and even plant your own tree. You'll be amazed on how many, how much trash is in the Everglades and how, how much trash these animals pick them up. You can also promote to help the Everglades as well.
and thank you for listening and always protect the environment. Very nice, awesome job. Um, I would say check the chat. Um, I think we have a few questions. If you have a question, please throw it in the chat now. And then Kiever has a little program for all of us. Can you get to the chat or do you need me to read them off? Should I stop the screen share? Yeah, you could just stop the screen share. I think it'll be easier for you that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if anyone has any questions about the Everglades, what lives there, um, et cetera, et cetera, what Kiever's seen there. I actually haven't been able to go down to the national park in like quite some time. I actually went there, um, I think maybe three or four summers ago. Nice. Um, I begged my dad to go down there. I kept on asking, can we go down? Can we go down? Because <laughs> usually, usually we just stop uh, next to the highway mm -hmm. and I do a lot of fishing. So we basically, you know, observe the Everglades while also fishing, but I wanted to take in depth the Everglades and I wanted to look at the heart of it. So the, the Everglades National Park is a very, very good destination to go to. What is the coolest thing that you've seen there? Hmm. Well, I mean, I'm, I like, I like Florida panthers and also American alligators as well. But um, they have a lot of trails that I do recommend as well. But on those trails, you can definitely see alligators swimming by you. Um, you can see a lot of birds. Um, if you're a photographer, you can definitely get a lot of photos of different birds, different species, different plants. Um, yeah, but I think while walking the trail, there, there's a group of alligators just swimming by and it was just very nice to see. Very nice. Um, we do have a few questions. Uh, does the Everglades have invasive plants life? They do, actually. Um, Plants and animals, they can get here by um, basically there's, you can, you can ship animals on boats and um, these boats actually need to, they need to dock and they get submerged a little bit into the water. And sometimes these boats actually get cracks and the animals can slip out through the water it's very crazy to believe, but it does happen. And they come ashore uh, to their closest land spot and they start living there. And since none of the animals know what that animal is, it basically doesn't have any predators. So it just preys on everything. And even the same with plant life. Very yes, cool. the Everglades, the Everglades is fresh and saltish brackwater it's brackish water as well. There are spots where it is fresh and there are spots where it's brackish because there are actually sharks in the Everglades, most commonly bull sharks. I have a question about that. For the bull sharks, you were saying that the alligators and the pythons are like the top predator. When the bull sharks are in there, do they sort of take over? It, do you know? Um, I'm not exactly sure. Um, you would think that the bull shark has more of the advantage because it does live in the water. Um, I'm not exactly sure if the bull shark would be an alligator or a python, but um, I'd love, I would love to research that. <laughs> it's good to highlight how vital an ecosystem the Everglades are. I feel like most people don't think about it often enough um, yeah. and think about how it is in such a danger already. So thank you very much for the program, Kiever. That was great. Um, for those of you who are coming next Saturday, I'm trying to think we have Mike Cashin coming and giving us an awesome presentation um, all about just being in the STEM field, how you could get into it, what sort of skills to look at. Um, he is currently working at the New York Aquarium, um, if I'm correct. I, I should have looked this up before I started talking, but it's fine. Um, Mike went to Stony Brook University on Long Island. 
um, for marine science. He has a ton of research experience, hands-on experience with animals. Um, and he is going to teach us a little bit about how he got into the field and what ways you could also get into the field. Um, so make sure you join us. It's the same link next Saturday at 1 p.m. Um, otherwise, thank you very much, Kiever. If you missed this, if you missed any of this, it is recorded. We'll do a quick edit and then put it onto our YouTube channel. Um, otherwise, thank you all for coming and have a great and safe day. Thank you.